Hello, I'm Dr. Paula Rosen from Education Update, and I'm honored to be here today with Dr. Gregory Hannon, who is one of the uh, mo foremost researchers in uh, breast cancer and pancreatic cancer, and uh, here at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Thank you for giving us your time hey, you're welcome. and being with us. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit about your research first, and then we'll go on to the graduate school that you helped to uh, found? Well, so um, I run a large and perhaps somewhat unruly research lab. We have a diversity of interests um, which grow out of the biology of small regulatory RNAs, non-coding RNAs. And we look at the roles of these RNAs in the protection of germ cell genomes from um, sort of parasitic genetic elements. We look at the roles of these non-coding RNAs in a variety of cancers, and then we build tools based on this regulatory system that allow us to look for uh, potentially novel targets for cancer therapy. What is the hope on the horizon for some of the solutions to cancer, particularly breast cancer and pancreatic cancer, which we know is a silent killer? Well, I mean, I think we come to know more and more um, about the cancers themselves. But of course, with increased knowledge about these various diseases, we understand that complexity and diversity is really what's challenging um, our approaches to maintaining or to, to um, you know, you hate to use the word cure, um, but if you want to think about trying to uh, look at these diseases in a way that would make them treatable, like a chronic condition, the way that has been um, achieved for something like HIV. Um, and I think that as we learn more and more about their genetic complexities, about the um, various genes upon which they depend for survival, the prospects for turning these into a manageable chronic conditions, I think, um, improve. I don't see that you know, this is a problem that we're going to solve in the next few years. It's a challenge that, because of the complexity, is going to persist for some time. Right. Now, can you tell us something about the graduate school uh, and how many students come through the program? But I know it's one of the premier programs and the most unusual one for a uh, place like this to offer. Well, I mean, this is an unusual graduate program. It's really founded upon the conviction uh, really Jim Watson's conviction that the, the term of graduate education was taking too long, that you were taking um, excited, you know, young students coming out of undergraduate school and essentially beating them into submission through, you know, 10 years of a, of a graduate grind, and leaving them, you know, without that burning enthusiasm that they had for science when they started graduate school. Um, and what Jim felt was that if we designed an innovative program that was, a, was really a curriculum designed to graduate students in four years um, and, and accelerate their progress toward scientific independence, that you know, we could not only apply this training to the most talented group of students to create sort of the leaders of science for the future, um, but also produce students that exited the program sort of with this tremendous upward trajectory and energy and were able to maintain it through this kind of short but very intense graduate experience. So is that the distinguishing feature, you would say, of the program here, that it's short, intense, and people are able to leave with their credentials? Well, I work? think that there are a lot of distinguishing features. I think that that's a one defining feature. Another defining feature is that we focus much more on teaching students how to be scientists, how to think and behave as scientists, to teach them how to formulate scientific questions, how to answer those questions, how to behave ethically as a scientist. We focus on these things much more than focusing on just the transfer of information. Scientific information is really growing at an explosive rate, and I think the critical skills are learning how to learn, learning how to manage that information, learn how to assimilate that information, and use it for uh, the purpose of answering questions that you're interested in. And, and so we, we have much more of a focus that, on that than on sort of a traditional, you know, teaching students biochemistry, genetics, etc. We have to do those basics to some degree, but our mission is really to teach students how to spend a lifetime learning as a scientist. Well, isn't this place unique compared to a university that uh, offers uh, students some labs and mostly courses given by academics, even though they're erudite, but here students can actually be in a laboratory all the time. Well, Isn't all that the, a unique feature? No, I think that, that all graduate programs in the you know the biomedical sciences that train 
students in the areas in which we train students um, are focused on a practical education in being a scientist. The, the, um, the defining principle of a PhD in, in the biological sciences is to do an important and original piece of work. Right. And so I, don't, I, I think that all programs, especially toward the final years of graduate school, have students essentially as full-time scientists. The difference here is that we try to compress the upfront part of the curriculum, the time that you spend in coursework, um, the time that you spend formulating your thesis project. Uh, we try to have those components of the program confined to about the first year, whereas they may stretch into three or four years in other I see. Programs. I see. And that's, that's one of the main ways in which we accelerate the timeline for graduate education. It seemed to me, on getting a tour of Cold Spring Harbor Lab today, that uh, this is really a mecca for learning. Uh, there are thousands of scientists who come from all over the world, and there are a continuous series of conferences here. Wouldn't the graduate students benefit from that? Well, they, they do tremendously. I mean, this is a small place. We tend to have rather focused um, areas of scientific interest. But those are augmented by the fact that we have very diverse meetings programs and we have diverse course programs which are meant for postgraduate education. Mm -hmm. And even though the Watson School has been running, I think this is our 11th year, the history of, of education teaching at Cold Spring Harbor is actually much longer. And the kinds of traditions that the tr traditions and innovation that we brought to um, postgraduate courses to meetings programs. Mm -hmm. That same spirit is of innovation is what we brought to graduate education. In fact, we've become a model uh, for education at a lot of different graduate institutions in the U.S. Now, I understand that you have one, a two-tier um, level of mentoring. Can you explain that? Um, sure. Every Ph.D. student has a thesis mentor, irrespective of where you are. Um, and that is the person with whom you formulate your thesis project and who helps to direct your thesis research. What we've added to that is, is an academic mentor whose job is less uh, to ensure that your thesis project is on track and that you do the science that you need to do to complete a PhD. Their job is much more the intellectual development of the student and to make sure that, um, that through their interactions with the scientific community, through their interactions with scientists outside, um, that they develop as a scientist, and also to provide a balance to the guiding hand of their scientific development, mm -hmm. um, to provide in some ways a check and balance on the thesis mentor to make sure that the needs of the student are always at the forefront. So is that two-tier system, should that be implemented in other places? Because it sounds like a terrific system. Well, it, it, it works well for us, um, and I, I do think that it is a generally good idea. It's a generally good innovation in school, um, and different students benefit from it to different degrees and use it to different degrees. Um, so I don't think that every student needs the two-tier mentoring, mm -hmm. um, but every student benefits from the possibility of taking advantage of well, is there anything else you'd like to tell us about this wonderful program that you helped to establish? And uh, I think it's been around for 10 to 12 years now. Yeah, I think, I think we've admitted our 11th class. Okay. Um, the only thing that I would say about it is that if we, 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 we tend to be a, high, a highly selective program. We train a very small number of students per year. And we try to be sensitive to the fact that, you know, the, the, the biomedical sciences are probably overtraining students at the moment. And it's difficult to sustain the enterprise of graduate education in biomedical sciences um, at the rate we're training students such that they can you know, go on and do postgraduate work as postdocs and then achieve faculty positions. Um, and it, I think it's important to recognize that small and highly selective programs like this are really focused on... Um, training graduate students to become leaders for the next generation of science. And much much more so than you know, sort of growing a base of graduate students that can sort of serve the needs of the community. 
So what you're saying is that overtraining does not really do the scientific community much good. And the graduate students even less so. Okay, because it just takes too long and then we're going to lose them? Is that what will happen if well, we overtrain? Well, I think that we're seeing a, a trend in um, the sciences right now of having students come out of their, um, their to completing their graduate education and having more trouble than before finding positions as, let's say, postdoctoral fellows. Postdoctoral fellows are facing a much tighter job market, and part of this is driven by the economy, um, the fact that a lot of programs evolve their training strategies during a time when the NIH budget was doubling, and now the NIH budget is flat, in fact, declining in terms of the, mm -hmm. the, the levels to which they're funding grants. And it's, I think in, it's incumbent upon us as educators to adjust to that and to make sure that we don't train more students than the system can sustain. I see. Thank you very much for sharing sure. these important insights with us. We appreciate it. Thank you.